Hello, all you beautiful students or handsome, whatever you like to go by, um, or if you like none of those, that's okay too. Today, we are talking about nutritional disorders and therapy. So this is a long lecture. So this is for students that are in the adult course or anyone who's wanting to learn more about general nutritional disorders and therapy. This is a long lecture. So this is not one of the short, sweet, simple ones. Um, I should have other ones um, on this topic that you can look under um, adult med surge unit four playlist. Um, so uh, nutritional disorders and therapy, really here we're covering malnutrition, we're covering obesity and metabolic syndrome. Um, so hopefully we can get in a little bit in here and learn about nutrition. Now, nutrition is not commonly focused on in most education, even though it is the key to pretty much every disorder and disease process we talk about. Um, or I should say for most diseases and disorders, uh, change in nutrition can make a big difference. Um, so it's important just we need to learn about what does malnutrition or just nutritional issues look like? Um, how are we going to assess these patients? How are we going to help them so that we can uh, be able to provide better outcomes for them in life. So anyway, here we go. So first let's talk about malnutrition. Um, you know, what is it? What do they look like? So malnutrition, a common misconception is that malnutrition means that someone has to be overweight um, or incredibly underweight. It can go both ways. Um, so in other words, just because someone is obese or overweight doesn't mean they're well nourished. You know, it's a common misconception. You see someone with extra weight on them and you're like, oh, you know, they must um, they, they obviously aren't missing any meals. They must, you know, uh, be eaten well and stuff like that. And that's a lot of bias and, um, you know, lack of education, you know, so you can't judge um, how nourished someone is by their size. Um, so, um, you know, there's many patients that are overweight or obese, but are not getting the basic nutrition that they need. So you all, you never need to, you should never judge a book by its cover, no matter what. Um, but you definitely need to look deeper in order really to understand malnutrition. Um, so um, first, some uh, key term here is going to be cachexia, or I think it's supposed to be pronounced cachexia. Um, but, um, you know, this is a general weakness in wasting, and it's well displayed in this picture um, where, you know, they have a, you can see a lot of their bones. There's a lot of the wasting away. Um, that kind of general appearance, that sunken in appearance. Um, and that's usually going to be someone who's underweight from out being malnourished, excuse me. Um, and so you're especially going to see it around their respiratory muscles. Other signs of malnutrition, and again, this can happen whether they're um, you know, obese or if they're underweight are going to be things um, like dry skin, uh, brittle nails, hair loss, I'll talk about the limb swelling here in a second. Um, uh, obviously, a decreased muscle mass or weakness um, and confusion, irritability. And this all goes back to if my cells aren't getting the nutrients they need, they're not going to be able to perform their functions. So, I mean, at the end of the day, when I need nutrients, my major organs are going to get those nutrients. And like a lot of the other stuff, like the integumentary system, you can say a lot of the issues here with the skin and otherwise, they start to um, really falter because I'm not sitting there and saying, oh, I really need to get this nutrition to my hair, you know, my, my other organs to uh, take first priority. Um, but, you know, there's also um, obviously going to be a weakness because they don't have nourishment, glucose, and other things they're going to need for energy. And that also goes where the confusion irritability is. Um, so also nutrition has to do with albumin, which is a plasma protein that's found or made in the liver. And so um, with these patients, what we see is, is when they don't have as much albumin um, because of the lack of nutrition, fluid doesn't stay where it's supposed to stay. So fluid starts to leak. And so even though these patients can be like really, you know, um, losing muscle mass and um, really appear this like cachexic appearance, um, they actually can have limb swelling. And that's just a result of fluid going where it's not supposed to go because there's a lack of, um, you know, plasma proteins that are needed to keep fluid in the bloodstream. So let's look at diagnostic studies. We want to do a really thorough history and assessment, especially about their intake, general preferences, any dietary um, things like kind of what's going like the ins and outs of the patient. Um, some labs we might check, you know, we do want to look for anemia because um, if you remember back learning about anemia, that anemia is closely related to nutrition. In other words, I need certain particles, I need certain things in order to build blood cells. Um, so if I'm, you know, if my, uh, what do you call it, I'm not getting nourished, I'm not gonna be able to make blood cells. So um, we'll check that CBC. And here's just some general ranges per the textbook that we use at my facility. Um, so that, um, you know, you might want to review. Um, so we can look at the hemoglobin hematocrit. Um, the hematocrit talks more about like fluid status, hydration, but um, the hemoglobin is going to tell us more specifically about anemia. 
Um, we also want to check protein levels. So that will be the pre-albumin and albumin. Um, and so these are both signs of nutritional status um, in uh, what do you call it, malnourished patients. The thing to keep in mind, though, is pre-albumin are baby albumin. So um, an albumin takes so long to filter through our system. So it's kind of like red blood cells, where if I just check a, you know, red blood cell count or, um, you know, things like that, it's not necessarily going to tell me how well I'm doing if I'm having like a slow loss or if there's like a, um, you know, long-term problem with my blood cells, I'm not making enough. Um, what We really want to see about how many cells I'm making. So in other words, like I could check an albumin, it could be normal, but a patient could be malnourished. So that's why we really like to use what's called the pre-albumin. This is showing me how much uh, plasma proteins I'm making. And if I'm malnourished, I am not going to be making uh, more albumin. So pre-albumin is the better measure to albumin. And I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, a little, you know, trick for life is generally never call a physician and say, hey, my albumin's low, I need albumin. There are some times that, um, you know, we give albumin and their albumin happens to be low, but just know it's not like blood where like their red blood cells are low. So we're going to give them red blood cells. So it's a little bit different. And that's a, like a deep path though that you do not have to understand it deep in death. And I know DW, if you're listening to this, that you're probably wondering what's going on at the cell level. But um, that is something for a different time. Maybe if you all go on to medical school and other things, the deepness. And I'm not saying that nurses can't know this stuff, but you know, a lot of times we can get so deep into the details, the why of the patho. Um, when as a nursing student, you need to be figuring out the why of the nursing versus the why of the patho. Like there will be time where you can nerd out. I love nerding out. I love to go deep, but you gotta first get through nursing school. So focus on like the why of what you're doing as a nurse, the thinking behind you as a nurse, the assessments, um, the other things and why you need to do them, how they're going to help your patient, the interventions you're going to do, the medications you're going to give. Think deep into the why you're giving them. How do you know they're working and not versus going really deep into the patho of the body? Because the body is pretty cool. Um, but like I said, there'll be time for you to do that. You definitely just want to, uh, for now, get through school. Um, <laughs> you got So yeah, and if you want to nerd out privately alone, you know, you do that. So I just don't want to confuse anyone else. But anyway, uh, moving on, uh, what do you call other labs that you're going to uh, want to look at is probably your electrolytes, because if you're not getting nourishment, you could be lacking in electrolytes, general like minerals and vitamins as well, um, and liver function, because the liver plays a key component in uh, nutritional status. So we'll want to check um, their AST and ALT. Now, I've just kind of generally combined both. Normal is not less than 36 for both, but it's really close. So as, as long as you're less than 36, you're doing pretty good with your ASTs. And ALTs. And I can't speak for other universities and things like that, but you know, where I where I work, we are not going to give you off by one point because we try not to be that mean. Um, we also want to look at body mass or what's known as BMI. Um, and so the body mass index. Um, in general, what we say is less than 25 is normal. Um, there does get to underweight, um, but we don't, you know, we so I guess I would say I'm pretty sure like underweight is oh, this looks oh yeah, underweight's the blue. I was sitting here, I was like gonna say, I thought it was like. 18. Yeah, I was gonna say it's usually about 18. So 18 to 25 is normal. Yeah, 18 to 25 is normal. Um, and then 25 to 29.9, it's overweight, and then 30 above is obese. Um, we also might want to see how well they can perform ADLs, because I can sit there, I can look at numbers all day, but if I'm not really thinking about overall, how is this patient doing? How is their quality of life? Like, so even with these numbers, it's kind of like, you know, you could look at an x-ray of a patient with arthritis, and not really know how sick they are. You have to listen to their symptoms. How are they feeling? What's their energy? Someone could also have, you know, um, fairly good labs, but not be having the energy they need, not have the, um, be showing other signs that they're not doing well. So ask them how life is going. How is day-to-day -day stuff going? Can they, um, you know, perform activities of daily living pretty well? So let's talk about what the big so what is, is, you know, what's the big deal? Why do we need to talk about this or learn about this? And like I said, it's, it's come, it's very common that we don't spend a lot of time on nutrition when we're teaching about medical education, nursing education, but it's so key because it leads to a lot of problems. It can lead to poor wound healing. If I don't have nutrients, I cannot fight infection. Um, it leads to pressure ulcers, or again, I said the skin is very highly affected. Um, it puts you at risk for increased infections. It changes your immune response. Um, it increases your risk for falls due to weakness. Um, and then also it can affect your mental status. So there's really high rates of depression and dementia associated with malnutrition. And that's just to name a few. 
Um, so what do we do to treat malnutrition? So of course we want to, the preference would be to give them, you know, oral nutrition. I'll talk about that, like, you know, that they would just take in, you know, the right nutrients and we'd work with the dietitian and get them up to par. But a lot of times that's not enough, especially for someone who is severely malnourished. Um, so a lot of times we end up having to do what's known as enteral feeding or tube feeding. Um, this is where we stick, uh, you know, there's different types of tubes. There's what are known as NG tubes or nasogastric tubes. If they have a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, a blah, blah, blah. Uh, why can't I even say, I was going to say, uh, I'm trying to say ET tube, but uh, endotracheal tube. I can talk. I've been in <laughs> <laughs> apparently having a day. Um, uh, endotracheal tubes, um, we can definitely um, uh, put an OG in. It's a little bit more appropriate. And then if we need something more long-term, if we need to bypass the stomach, um, we can put in what's called a Dobhoff. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we can also place PEG tubes or J tubes as well. And those are, um, you know, placed in, like, you know, either directly like a uh, PEG is like an endoscopic um, uh, or uh, sorry, yeah, what do you call it? Percutaneous, um, uh, like tube that goes in through the stomach. I can, I can finish it. And just jejunostomy, say it five times fast. Um, that is something that goes in through the jejunum. Um, so it's, it goes a little bit past the stomach. So, and um, you don't have to know crazy in depth about why someone would need one tube over the other. The only thing you do want to know about that is for the Dobhoff, this is really good for patients that have pancreatitis, um, which we'll talk about later, um, or patients that are having problems. Um, we don't want them to have any irritation in their stomach. This allows us to bypass the stomach. Um, it also decreases their risk for aspiration because if I have a tube that's all the way, um, you know, past my stomach, um, I'm going to have less chance of reflux, which is why, you know, they're at risk for aspiration. So Dobhoffs are great when we can get them, but not every patient or most patients are not going to have them. Um, so anyway, but um, so pretty much we're, we're inserting these tubes in order to give nutrition and we give, you know, a liquid nutrition, which we'll talk about. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind in order to do this type of feeding, they have to have a functioning GI tract. In other words, you know, if they don't have bowel sounds, um, we're not going to be, you know, feeding them this way because um, we want to make sure that they don't have, you know, an ileus or other things. So kind of patients that might get this, patients with cancer that are already malnourished, um, neurological disorders that might not have the mental capacity in order to eat. And then we're going to see it often and critical illness as well, like in the ICU. Um, there are other patients too that need it. A lot of the GI disorders we talk about, it's possible they might need them. Um, so um, some of the things I want to work on with these patients, I like I said, aspiration is a really big concern. So I always want to assess that my uh, tube is in the right place um, and that it's, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, correctly inserted before I administer. So uh, most student times when I ask students, um, you know, how are you going to know it's in the right place? They say like pH. And I'll be honest, I have never in my life seen anyone check a pH. And, um, it, you know, at least at my, um, you know, facility, we do not talk about checking pH. Um, there is like the air bolus that a lot of people do. And that's usually the first thing that people do. Um, but it's, it's really not very accurate. So like the most accurate thing that we do for all patients is going to be to get what's called a KUB, which is kidneys, ureter, bladder, x-ray. Um, and what it does is it tells us it actually verifies the placement of that tube. Um, and, um, you know, then the doctor can put it in order that that tube is okay to use. But as the nurse, your role is going to be um, to note most of these tubes have markings on them that are going to tell you, um, you know, where the tube is when you first put it in and you want to check every shift. And uh, again, if you're concerned that it has been, um, has moved, maybe the patient's been tugging at it or something, um, you can um, uh, check to see if it's at the right place. Um, so we always want to check the um, markings on the tube. And we're going to assess for bowel sounds, like I said, before feeding them. Uh, make sure they're in a good position is going to help prevent aspiration as well. Um, so we want to make sure that we are um, setting the patient's head of bed up. We want them at at least 30 degrees and um, they don't have to be at 90 degrees all the time or anything crazy like that. Um, but we usually like them, you know, like 30, 45 degrees. And sometimes we might send them up a little higher, but that's patient dependence. But I would say as long at least 30 degrees is what you want to remember. Um, and then depending on hospital policy, like this is kind of something that's going away and textbooks are starting to get updated with it, is that we don't really check this anymore, but we used to, um, I, I mean, I still do, but in some facilities do, it depends on the facility, but um, we check gastric residual. And what that means is, is that, um, and we don't do this with Dob Hoss, but with a regular NG or OG tube, um, we pull back on the tube, uh, maybe once a shift or, you know, every like twice a shift, just depending. Um, and um, we see how much is left in their stomach. Um, we want 
want to make sure that they're tolerating that feeds because a lot of patients, they're going to have trouble with motility, which I'll talk about in the hospital um, with these feeds because they're not moving. They're not getting up. They're not um, very active. And so as a result of that, they're not going to uh, be able to um, uh, we have the same uh, GI mode the utility, like, so in other words, me right now, like if I ate something, I'm going to get up and walk around. And that actually creates peristalsis, which allows me to digest my food. Patients in the hospitals, they're laying down, they're not getting up, moving around a lot. So um, they're going to have problems with uh, a lot of times uh, motility. So I'm, I'm pretty much making sure that they're not just backing up and have a ton of tube feeds still in their stomach, like they can't digest it. Um, so I'm going to be checking that again per policy. Um, you may be wondering what this thing is here in this picture or this blue thing on this tube. What this is called is a bridle and it actually wraps around, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, we call it the, it, you put it around the nose and you use a magnet and it actually hooks around. I don't know, I wanna say not the nut, like what do you call it? The, um, I don't know why I'm gonna call it the middle bone between your nose. I know there's official name, but it's eluding me right now. And I am perfectly fine with admitting that I am, uh, what do you call it? Um, I do not know the names for every part of the body. So, but um, you put it uh, you know, in between, you wrap it around uh, and effectively it, uh, it allows for a more permanent uh, securement of these tubes. Now we don't bridle for all patients, but if I have a patient that's really high likely to pull something, I really want that tube to get in. If they pull on a tube, once it's bridled, it will literally give them the worst headache of their life. They're going to be very motivated not to pull it. Um, so, and it's, um, it's tied, but it's secured. Uh, I don't want to, I know I want to keep saying like the nasal bridge, but I know it's not that, I don't know. There's something else. It's going to drive me nuts, but you can make fun of me all you want. I'm okay with it. Uh, you got to stay humble. Um, overall, though, here, again, placement of tube, um, you want to verify the markings, you want to verify by um, the x-ray. Uh, we don't have to get daily x-rays to make sure it's still in the same place. If it moves or if we have to reinsert it, we would need to get another x-ray. But generally, we just go by the markings. Otherwise, checking to make sure they're not, you know, getting too much. Because, again, the big problem here is, is if I'm keeping a whole bunch in my stomach, it can easily back up and I can aspirate. And then um, you want to uh, be cautious, uh, you know, with the position and stuff that you have them in and make sure they uh, have bowel sounds as you're feeding them. So here's kind of an example. If it's not put in there, this is where it should be. Um, this is what your KUV would look like. It should be in the stomach. Um, but if it's in the lung, you can see where it's kind of going here and, uh, you know, getting into uh, one side of the lung. We definitely do not want to feed the lungs. So always make sure you have a verified placement before you start that feed. Um, other complications that we can have skin breakdown. So we could have skin breakdown around the tube. Um, you could also have skin breakdown on your bottom from diarrhea. So you want to watch your skin closely. Uh, like I mentioned, they have decreased motility just as, as I'm running into things as a result of um, what do you call it? The fact that they're not getting up and moving because movement, just like, um, it, you know, I'm always going to bring it back to cardiac, just like in cardiac, how the muscles squeeze and create like a muscle pump, which pushes blood back to my heart. When I'm up walking around, um, peristalsis or I'm um, like, you know, contraction of my bowels happens, which is why like, you know, um, that, you know, exercise is so important to prevent constipation, which we'll talk about, um, cause it's all about that movement. Um, so one medication we can use is what's known as metoclopramide, also known as Reglan. You'll hear about this. We'll talk about it with nausea too, but it effectively um, helps to increase motility or increase that contraction in the bowels to allow for better um, what we call gastric emptying or the stomach emptying into the intestines. Uh, so there's also a uh, concern for hyperglycemia. This, uh, the two feeds and things that we use, it has to be preserved and also it needs neutral. Well, uh, I'm going to get back to ignore the preserved thing. I'm going to say the reason there's hyperglycemia is because you have to think about what we're giving. We're giving nutrition and what's a part of nutrition, glucose, they need energy. So even if the patient's not diabetic, we're going to check a blood glucose, usually like every four to six hours, just depending on how high their blood glucose is. Usually the routine for most hospitals every six hours. So then as a result of the fact that I have tube feeding and think about like all of the frozen dinners and stuff that you have, how do they preserve that? They preserve that with salt. And so, um, you know, they do the same thing with tube feeding. So it has extra salt in it. So it's really common for people that are on um, enteral feedings to have high sodium or hypernatremia. So um, we treat this just by flushing it out by like diluting it. So we, um, with the tube feeds, we can also give them what we call free water or like think of it like um uh, effectively uh 
like drinking water. Like how when you when you eat a meal, except for you, some of you crazy Texans, like you just eat an entire meal and then drink water. And I don't know how you do that. And it's I'm not judging, um, maybe five percent judgment. Um, but you know, like as a whole, I don't know how y'all do it. Most people that eat a couple bites drink something, so you're flushing it down. You're helping um, with the digestion stuff, but particularly for hypernatremia, it's going to dilute that extra sodium. Um, so you can do that. Well, let's say that, um, you know, we don't want too much water and stuff on them. We can also uh, give what's called D5W. Um, and this is this is an IV fluid, um, but it doesn't have to be at an incredibly high rate for it to work usually. Uh, but it works just like free water where it's going to dilute that extra sodium in the blood. Um, and a doctor will decide uh, which one of those is most appropriate for the patients, but effectively diluting the extra sodium. Um, there's also um, the possibility of diarrhea. Um, so we really want to make sure that the patient is staying hydrated, like I said, and because um, uh, if they're, we're worried with diarrhea about them losing fluid and electrolytes. Um, so we definitely want to keep an eye on those. We want to watch their skin closely. And, um, you know, usually diarrhea is kind of expected with two feeds, but you always want to make sure you're watching the expiration. Sometimes the patient's on trickle feeds or slow feeds, and you're really, you're supposed to change the tube feeds every 24 hours um, per most facilities policies. Um, but you'll see some people that leave it up until the bottle's empty because they don't want to waste any, but you really need to watch that expiration. And if you let it hang for too long, it could spoil just like spoiled milk. And um, that could lead to even worse than diarrhea. Um, so when you're giving medications through to, uh, to uh, a feeding tube, I can say it, um, is you want to make sure that, you know, whenever possible, and you can talk with the pharmacy with this and the doctor can sometimes place a different order. Or sometimes the pharmacy will go ahead and switch it for you if they know it's just, a, um, you know, the consistency. But if it's possible, change to liquid medications. It's going to go easier in the tube and have a less chance of getting stuck or leading to blockages. Um, they should avoid any extended release medications because, again, um, if we're putting it in tube feeds, we're not sticking a whole pill down the tube, the, the tube there. If you are, that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, so if I have an extended release medication, if I'm I have to crush it or if I have to open it, um, those are intended to be given slowly over time. Like they're intended to work naturally in the stomach um, the way that the stomach is supposed to slowly break them down. So if I crush them, if I mess with them, and so this would be anything that has like XR on it. Um, sometimes the, I want to say like, uh, what do you call it? Um, ER for extended release. Some of them, I've seen some that say XL. So just like be very careful, look at, the medications and um, you know pharmacy usually labels them on your mar and it will say like do not crush but um, double check because remember you're that last measure because pharmacy doesn't always know what kind how the patients well pharmacy doesn't know how the patient's receiving medication so you're really that last stop um, so always check it uh, to see if your medications are extended release or not you should not crush them um, but if you're using tablets uh, make sure to use a pill crusher and you're gonna have to mix it with some water to help um, dissolve it but effectively you want to make those pills those tablets cap whatever, as tiny as possible, because you really don't want to clog your tube. These things are a pain. I've clogged the tube before. It is not fun. Even sometimes to the best of your abilities, it can happen. Um, so you want to make sure that you are not putting some really thick stuff in there. You want to make sure that you're flushing before and after, have a good patent tube, and are keeping your tube patent as a whole. Um, you know, regular maintenance of a patient with tube feeding is going to require usually regular, like even if it's just a little bit of fluid, um, flushing that tube, making sure it stays patent. All right, so now let's talk about parenteral nutrition. So parenteral nutrition is for patients that um, maybe don't have a working GI system. So we talked about with enteral nutrition, this is for patients that have a working GI system um, that, uh, what do you call them, are able, they have bowel sounds and they're able to digest. Well, there's some patients that need nutrition, um, but they can't ingest, digest, or absorb nutrients for whatever reason. And this could be because they have obstruction, they have just severe malnutrition. So sometimes like I've had patients before that are on um, enteral feeds and parenteral feeds. Um, so sometimes they need that extra help or sometimes they're on parenteral and taking in regular diet, they need that extra help. Um, but it allows, this is administration of nutrients via IV. Um, and the cool thing about it is it's customized to the patient. So literally the pharmacy makes this bag of, um, of nutrition for this patient based on their needs. They look at their labs, um, you know, they work with a uh, dietitian and stuff like that. And they can kind of look at what are the patient's general needs. Um, and they look at their kidney function, a lot of different stuff and figure out what does the patient need. But um, it utilizes just like with tube feeding, it utilizes sugar for calories. There's a lot of precautions with this because this isn't just like, hey, yeah, just go ahead, and give them some extra nutrition. 
Um, so if we're talking about true TPN, because there is also what's known as PPN, which is peripheral parenteral nutrition, which I'll talk about, but um, TPN is total parenteral nutrition. And this is, um, we're, we're, in order to safely give this, um, we uh, we need to make sure that we give it with uh, the appropriate type of line. So we have to give TPN through a central line. And the reason for that is, is because it is so, there's such big particles that are in TPN. Um, it has high fat content um, and it has really large molecules that are in it. Um, it would overwhelm and clog and possibly clot off a smaller uh, blood vessel. So it needs a large blood vessel um, to go into. So the, they need a central line. Um, so that comes with its own complications, which we'll talk about. So there is what's known as PPN. So maybe just short term, they need something. We can do PPN, but just keep in mind with this, this is not specialized to the patient. It's just going to be a general bag. It's going to have general nutrition. It's not going to have the same fat emulsions and other things that the TPN can offer, but it can be a good bridge if we're trying to get it waiting for a central line to get in, or if they maybe just need it short term. Um, so um, we can definitely also use um, that as well. Um, uh, whether it's TPN or PPN, it's a two nurse sign off, and you're usually going to go through and read through all of the nutrients that are in the bag. Um, in order to make sure that it's the right patient, um, you know, the right dose and things like that, um, and uh, make sure that you have everything set up the way that you're supposed to. Because the other thing I didn't mention is um, you're going to want to use a filter. Like I said, there's large particles, and anytime there's large particles in some a medication you're giving, you're going to need a filter. It helps to separate some of those particles and make it not so overwhelming into the bloodstream. Um, and we change our bag and the tubing every 24 hours. So usually this falls, sometimes it can fall at 1800, which is six p.m. Um, but most hospitals that I've worked at, it's 9 p.m. So night shift changes it out. Um, so you just want to be prepared for that with all your proper supplies, your pump, um, your filter, um, and make sure your access is appropriate. So it's great to finally have nutrition, but there can be some complications that can happen. So first and foremost, um, we need to monitor for imbalances. They can have what's called refeeding syndrome. And this is where your body's like, holy crap, like there's all these nutrients that have suddenly come in. Um, and so it gets overwhelmed. And what happens is, is they get fluid retention and then they also get um, uh, electrolyte imbalances. And over here, it kind of talks about what the electrolyte balances are. They get low potassium, low magnesium, low phosphate. Um, um, and then they're holding on to a lot of sodium and water. Um, they can also have a thiamine deficiency, but you don't, again, don't need to know deep cell level. Just realize that the body is reacting to the sudden influx of nutrients. Um, and because of shifts in fluid and um, like things at the cell level, um, you know, they, um, uh, they can end up having some very severe imbalances. Um, the other really big thing, and I've seen a lot of test questions about this, is all about blood sugar. So just as much as with enteral feedings, we're worried about them having a um, high blood glucose. It's especially because we are putting like straight up sugar for calories into their bloodstream. Um, so everyone who is on TPN should be monitored every four to six hours for their blood glucose. And um, I find more with um, TPN than uh, enteral nutrition that uh, they're going to have imbalance balances. Cause again, it's straight sugar. Um, so, um, we're going to check their blood sugar often and keep in mind because this is straight sugar into the blood. If we stop that TPN suddenly, like let's say my bag ran out and pharmacy hasn't sent me my new bag, uh, which hopefully doesn't happen, but it can happen sometimes. Um, just know that you can't just be like, okay, I'll just wait. They can have severe hypoglycemia, even if they're not a diabetic, because their body is getting kind of used and accustomed to this like constant influx of sugar. So, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Here's a little, like a little rhyme for you. Give D10 if you stop TPN. Uh, you like it? So um, you want to definitely make sure that um, you have D10 nearby in your room. Like you're not, you're not going to um, just turn it off and wait for your next bag. We also don't just um, turn TPN off. Like let's say they're doing great. They're ready to eat. We slowly taper it off. So it's kind of like steroids where we don't want them to have that sudden reaction. Um, we're going to watch the, for their other organ dysfunction because TPN can especially affect the liver, but it can also affect the kidneys. Um, so we're going to be watching for that. And we're going to be watching because we're giving them straight up fat, um, it can increase their lipids. So we're going to watch that closely. Um, you know, it's kind of a cool, like if you're into ICU stuff, you don't need to know this for exam purposes, but maybe one day you'll need to know this for practice is that if someone's on TPN and then they're also receiving propofol because um, they're intubated, a lot of times we also have to uh, watch their dose 
dose um, based on, you know, the factor that can only go so high up on their um, propofol, other things, because um, the lipid content is too much. Um, then we're also going to monitor for too much fluid. So this is like a continuous IV fluid. Um, so we need to do just like we would for any IV fluid. We need to monitor for fluid overload. What's their intake? What's their output? Um, you know, how um, how well are they breathing? Because remember, one of the first places that people are going to show signs of fluid overload are going to be in the lungs. We're going to look for those wet lung sounds, or I should say listen for those wet lung sounds, those coarse crackles. Um, daily weight. The daily weight is going to help tell us whether they are gaining fluid, but also hopefully will tell us whether they're gaining nutrition as well. Um, and then, like I mentioned, having a central line uh, puts you at risk for a lot of complications. So, um, you know, you definitely want to know the signs and symptoms of infection of a central line because that can be definitely, a, that's a test taking tip there. Because um, a lot of times we, you may be thinking like, we're like, what's a complication um, from TPN? And you're thinking about nutrition, you're thinking about fluid, you're not thinking about the line it's going into. Um, but we definitely want to worry about infection. Um, we're going to do um, aseptic or, you know, sterile technique with their dressing changes and then um, um, you know, maintain uh, the policies, whatever the hospital are for um, keeping that line clean, dry and intact. I feel like there's something else I want to say, but I want to keep going. So um, malnutrition, overall priorities and interventions. So this is for everybody. We want, um, uh, you know, good, adequate nutrition. And keep in mind, because their nutrition is altered, they can also have fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Um, some patients are going to need medication to stimulate their appetite because they might not have an appetite at all. Um, we're going to need to look, as nurses, we need to look for malnutrition in our assessment, look for those subtle signs in our labs, diagnostics, and physical assessment. Um, if they are overweight um, but malnourished, we want to, you know, teach them lifestyle changes that might help. And then um, we want to encourage nutrition whenever possible. So um, we can do, do intraparental nutrition, but there's also dietary supplements like this Boost or Insure, et cetera. These are just a couple examples of some companies. There's a lot of different ones too, just depending where what your hospital buys. Um, but giving them those shakes. Now, a lot of times people get those shakes on their tray. They don't want to drink them. It's really helpful to encourage them. Even sometimes, like if they're like, I don't want to drink it, I'll say, how about you just take your meds with it? Something like that. Um, and then um, we do daily weights um, with these patients usually, and also calorie counting where we sometimes say, okay, we literally count all the calories that are going in and see if it meets their needs. And a dietitian would pick that up and calculate that. It's, it's only your job as the nurse in that to write down what they ate. All right, so let's talk about obesity. Um, this is definitely something that's important to learn about and know. One sec. Um, because we definitely want to make sure that these patients um, are getting taken care of. There's a lot of prejudices and bias around obesity. There's a lot of misinformation and um, lack of understanding around this. But there's this is definitely a group of people that um, are, you know, a problem that's coming up for a lot of people. So it's really important as a nurse to be familiar with this and to understand, you know, what's behind this, how to properly um, take care of patients that may struggle with obesity. So um, obesity is officially defined as someone who has a body weight beyond their body's physical requirements. Um, it could be as a result of genetics. There are certain diseases that can predispose people to be obese. Um, certain ethnicities are more at risk for being obese. And there's also environmental or psychological factors as well. Um, so uh, we classify and diagnose obesity similar to malnutrition by BMI, which is looking at that weight and height. Remember, um, it's greater than 25 is overweight, greater than 30 is obese. Um, we also look at waist circumference. So um, men who have a waist circumference greater than 40 are going to be at risk. Um, and women who have a waist circumference greater than 35 are going to be um, considered uh, obese. Or um, and I won't even say considered obese. I want to take that back and say they're going to be considered more at risk for having health problems related to that. Um, we can also look at their waist to hip ratio. Um, and you guys do not need to know those numbers. I would know your BMIs and I would know your waist circumferences. We can also look at body shape. So, you know, me personally over here, I'm living the, uh, what is it? The, uh, the pear life. Yeah, I'm living the pear life. 
um, where, um, you know, most of my fat is mostly in my upper thighs and my legs. And so, um, you know, this is not an end all be all. So if you're watching this and be like, oh, I'm a pear, I don't need to worry about heart disease. That's not necessarily true. Um, but it's just, you have to think about where the weight's distributed, where does it put the most pressure on? So um, people with pear shape have more, um, you know, they might have more of the arthritis, varicose veins, cellulite issues, a lot of the bone issues and stuff, because you got to think about where the pressure is. Um, whereas people that have more of an apple shape, where most of their fat is in their um, abdominal or upper body area, um, they're going to be more at risk for like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, breast cancer, insulin uh, problems, um, cholesterol, blood pressure issues. Again, but you can't look at a patient and say this, well, this is because you're an apple shape. Like that is never something to say, please, Jesus. <laughs> and so, um, but um, it's just something to know as the nurse, you have to think about where, where's the fat putting a pressure on their body. Because when you think about uh, obesity, you want to think about too much pressure. Um, the pressure pushes up on the lungs. And if there's pressure pushing up on my lungs, I can't take a deep breath. Um, so even like, you know, in pregnancy and stuff like that, um, or ascites and liver failure, there's like too much pressure in my abdominal area. It leaves for less space for expansion of my lungs. It also put pressure down on my joints, which is why when we talked about arthritis, we talked about, um, you know, obesity for osteoarthritis being being a big risk factor. And it also puts pressure on my heart. So it pushes up against my lungs and my heart, leading for less ability to expand and pushes down on my joints. Um, so we definitely just want to keep in mind where's the pressure is really what we want to look at as nurses. Um, obesity can be a lifelong battle. So you need to understand your own opinion. So um, you know, if you've never struggled with obesity or, uh, you know, you might have your own bad experiences with it, maybe you were and, you know, you were able to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and pull it together. Um, that's great. And a lot of um, nurses can have an opinion that it's a matter of willpower, that it's, hey, it's just up to this person. They're just, you know, being lazy or not taking care of themselves. Um, but that is the worst attitude that you can have towards any patient is uh, making a judgment about their behaviors, regardless of what they're saying or what your own preconceived notions are. If you go into every room of an obese patient and automatically assume they don't take care of themselves or there's, um, you know, something they could have done more. It's just a matter of them, um, you, know, you know, getting off their butt or doing something like you're going to have a big struggle um, taking care of a lot of patients. And, you know, you're going to miss out on opportunities to provide compassionate teaching and also to be a person to really listen and get to the bottom of things because there's so many things that can that can cause obesity. So, um, you know, the best thing you can do as a nurse is grow in your own understanding of your own bias that you you might have against these patients. Um, there's a lot of specialized training and things needed to work in bariatric care full time. So just know um, education is so key. It's not just about the patient. Um, you know, nurses need to be educated. They need to understand how they're approaching people, the things they're saying, the way they're treating them, and how um, that could affect their care or their ability, you know, to want to change. What would make a person who's obese want to change if a nurse is going in constantly and making comments, um, shaming them, or, um, you know, telling them, um, you know, like, you just need to do this. This is really simple. Have you tried to diet? Have you tried? Did you ever exercise? Like, you know, that like what would make a person want to seek health care and get help and get better if they can um, or get through those barriers if they don't feel safe? And so um, we need to create a safe environment for these patients to open up. And, you know, maybe there is some of that. Maybe some of that's true. Maybe some of that is contributing. But um, until we break down the barriers that we put between ourselves and obese patients, we're never going to make any progress. Um, so TED talk done. <laughs> so I'm maybe done. I'm not, big, I might not be done yet. <laughs> um, nutritional therapy is key. And again, remember these patients can be obese, but malnourished. So be looking for those signs for being malnourished and uh, look for those signs of uh, making sure that the patient has uh, the adequate nutrients. Cause a lot of times, you know, there are times that these patients aren't educated on what proper nutrients are. Um, when I was in nursing school, I did, you know, of course this is with kids, um, but I did a, um, a teaching for some kids about, um, you know, they were all at risk for diabetes. They were showing early signs of diabetes. This is an elementary school. You know, when I asked them to point out like what foods are healthy um, at certain fast food restaurants and other stuff. And a lot of them said ice cream because it has milk in it and milk is good for you because it's calcium. And part of that is true, but it, it's not exactly true. Like they're, they're missing some. And so you'd be surprised. There's a lot of, there's also a lot of fad diets and other things that are out there that like a lot of times people go to really extreme measures to try to lose weight and do other things. And then they end up in a very unhealthy malnourished cycle. Um, so it's really um, what we really want to encourage people is about lifestyle changes. And sometimes, you know, it's 
all changes to obesity are not always necessarily, hey, you need to change your diet. Like um, food and diet is such a key part of nutrition, but there's other lifestyle factors too. If the patient's not sleeping, if they are stressed out or have a job that never allows them um, to do things like meal prep, cook, um, get rest, like sleep is such a big part of weight gain um, that people don't even realize. So just know when I'm talking about lifestyle changes, I'm not just talking about diet. I'm talking about they really need to focus on holistically as a whole, how can they start to change their life that will support healthy habits? Because um, yeah, they, they could do keto or other things and lose some weight pretty quickly, but can they maintain and sustain that for the rest of their life? So we really want to do things that are going to work with their lifestyle, but we want to look at their lifestyle as a whole and see what we can do to help with that. Um, exercise is also really key with these patients. Um, so some people want to exercise their way out of it just alone. Um, the, it's really a mix. So they should be looking at exercise. They should be looking at diet. They should be looking at their sleep and they should be looking at their stress. Um, and sometimes there's other, other things as well, but a lot of that lifestyle is going to be key. Not one alone is going to do it. So um, again, like you can sit there, change your diet and exercise, but if you're getting four hours of sleep a night and incredibly stressed out, you would be amazed at how hard it is to lose weight. Um, we want them to set realistic, healthy goals. Um, so it's really easy to like, you know, doctors can sometimes really scare the patients and be like, you have to lose weight now. And they're like getting into these crazy fad diets and really extreme things. But we want to provide support that's actually going to work long term. And then, you know, there's a lot of accountability things. There's Fitbits. You know, I used to do the challenges and my husband would laugh at me because it would be like 11 o'clock at night and I'd be um, running out. Like I'd be like, I got to get blah, blah, blah past me on our Fitbit challenge. Like I got to get out there. I got to beat them. Um, and so, you know, we could definitely get in our, uh, get into some of these fun things. Um, Weight Watchers is great for, um, it works for a lot of people. There's my fitness pal where you can have accountability. And, you know, some people find that, you know, they are actually powerless over their ability um, to stop eating the way that they're eating. And so it's just like with Alcoholics Anonymous, um, where they are powerless over the ability to not go back to alcohol. Um, so Overeaters Anonymous is another great option for patients that might have issues with, um, you know, it's like everything you're trying, you're trying dieting, and they're still always going back to the eating, it may be something actually out of their control. So um, definitely let them know about resources in their community. Now the TED Talk's over, I think. <laughs> so um, bariatric surgery. Um, so uh, criteria in order to receive bariatric surgery, um, usually you have to have a BMI greater than 40 or you have to have a BMI greater than 35 plus have something significantly that's going to um, create uh, a problem like a health concern like high blood pressure, sleep apnea, which can put you really at risk for a lot of cardiovascular complications, um, heart failure or diabetes. Um, they can, again, this kind of goes back to maybe my TED talk's not over. <laughs> so sorry, but eventually this PowerPoint will be over. It's, I've only got, so I've got less than 10 slides left. So, um, uh, surgery can have great long-term effects, but it has to be paired with lifestyle changes. Um, and so, in other words, this is not a quick fix. And, um, you know, it's not that like, hey, I get this surgery and then I'm not going to want to eat and then everything will be okay. There could be some serious complications if a person with an eating disorder or a person who does not change their lifestyle gets this procedure. And I'll talk about some of those. Um, but um, we we cannot just give these patients this like, it's not a magical cure, like, hey, you do this and then everything's great. Um, there's a lot of other things to consider. So, um, but on the positive, if someone does get this procedure and and follows the regimens and takes care of themselves and makes permanent lifestyle changes, they can see a, a, a weight loss, which can help with a lot of um, the symptoms and the pain and discomfort they're feeling, um, and then also can reduce um, their comorbidities. So, um, you know, in, if they have diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, it can help alter a lot of these problems. Um, remember, these are not, these are considered modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stuff. And so it's modifiable because there are things that we can do to manage them. Even though we can't change the fact that we have diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, we can start to manage or um, decrease uh, how high our risk is. Um, so insurance in order to pay for this is going to require multiple attempts of weight loss and they have to do extensive counseling. Like, is there any untreated psychiatric condition or untreated eating disorder? Because those patients are not safe to have these. So there's a few different types of bariatric surgeries. Um, there's what are called restrictive, where we literally shrink or make the stomach smaller um, in size. You know, the theory there being less size, less ability to eat, so less absorption of nutrients, so you lose weight. 
Um, and then there's the malabsorptive, where you take part of the where uh, where you're actually going to be absorbing nutrients, which is the small intestines, and we shorten or bypass that. So you're going to absorb less. Literally, there's going to be less places for you to actually absorb food. Therefore, you're going to absorb less. Uh, most people get um, there is some restrictive surgeries. I have pictures. There's like the gastric balloon um, and the ba the the gastric bands, which is what this one is, um, where they literally make you a tiny little tummy here. Um, so um, they're definitely uh, can do a lot of the restrictive surgeries, but you're probably the most common one you're going to hear about. And the one you're going to see most often on exams is going to be what's this one, which is a combination. It's called a Ruan Y gastric bypass. So I have pictures on it on my next slide. So um, this is the intragastric balloon where they literally put these inflatable balloons in your stomach and it allows for less space or a feeling of fullness. And so people do not eat as much. Um, I want to say, blah, 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 blah. there's one that's like a, I want to say that there's, mm, and again, I'm just looking at these real quick. So I want to say this is like the sleeve where they cut off part of the stomach and bypass. But yes, but um, the big here, this is the thing that you want to think of as a whole when it comes to gastric bypasses. Effectively, what we're doing is we take off part of the stomach and make the stomach really small. So that's the restrictive part of um. Uh, what do you call it? Is that what I'm I saying this right? Yeah, restrictive. Okay, I'm not crazy. Restrictive part is we make the stomach smaller. But then we also take off part of the duodenum. And so we pretty much attach that new small stomach down farther in the intestine. So it bypasses that area it's going to absorb. So um, that's where it's restrictive and malabsorptive, uh, where it actually bypasses um, where you're going to absorb nutrients and has a smaller pouch for you to actually, um, you know, get nutrients in. Um, so post-operative, you want to make sure, and this kind of goes back to some of the kind, compassionate care you want to give for patients that are bariatric patients. Make sure you have appropriately assized equipment and clothing for them. Uh, make sure that you have a, uh, you know, they may need a larger blood pressure cuff, a larger gown, a bariatric bed. Um, now, you know, some, I've seen some nurses that even when a patient's a little bit larger, they put these huge gowns and then make sure the gown fits them. I um, mean, definitely don't want their gown to be tight, but you also don't want to put a, you know, a bariatric gown down on a patient that is not that large, um, it can definitely uh, make them feel off. But same thing, you don't want to bring any attention or make this seem like there's anything abnormal. You're just bringing them these things. Um, you want to monitor their respiratory status closely because like I was bringing up before, if there's extra adipose tissue or fat on a patient, it's going to push inward and upward on that diaphragm, um, inward on the lungs, upward on the diaphragm. There's more pressure on top, so they can't expand as well. So they're going to be more at risk for things like atelectasis and pneumonia. Um, IV access can be more tricky on these patients. So a lot of times um, it's going to be hard. They have good blood vessels, but they might be deeper. So they may need like a sano guided IV placed. Um, keep in mind that a lot of medications, including anesthesia, are retained in adipose tissue. It may take this patient a little bit longer to wake up, or they could have periods where they're you know, waking up, falling back asleep, etc. Um, movement is very important to prevent complications in these patients. And overall, they're going to have high risk of complications, which I'll talk about. So you really want to watch them closely because they're just high risk based on their um, obesity status. So here's some kind of larger gowns. There's lifts and other things. There's larger, wider wheelchairs. You want to have a good bed. You know, the thing I hate to see is when I see, you know, a patient that's a larger that's in a bed and they can barely like move side to side. There's not enough space. Um, the, the hospital can order barriers bariatric beds. And most patients that have bariatric units or do these kind of surgeries automatically have these kind of beds. Um, but if you need to order it, it's best to order it early. Um, you don't want that patient to be uncomfortable or not be able to turn in their bed as a result. And here shows different blood cuff sizes. Make sure you have the right size. Um, and there's going to be some patients that you cannot get the big blood pressure cuff around their arm. Um, so sometimes you're going to have to do somewhere different. Just make sure that you are appropriate. You're putting it on appropriately and it does fit correctly. So post-bariatric diet, and this is not a joke, um, is that immediately post-operatively, they get very little. It's all very high protein liquid diet. Um, so we give them water, sugar-free, clear liquids given. We'll talk about why the sugar-free um, here a little bit later. Um, and they get very small portions, like literally usually their tray comes when I'm taking care of these patients and it's little pill cup size, like they might have five or six pill cup size and that will fill them up. Sometimes they can't even get those pill cup 
liquids without getting full. Um, so we do not want to stretch or tear or, um, you know, rip anything. So we need to stay with small portions um, and liquid diet. And so this is where, uh, well, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait for my TED Talk for the next slide. All right. Um, so long term, we need to teach them to eat slowly. They should stop when they are um, stop eating when they're full. And we do not want them to consume liquids with solid foods because you have to think about this. If I'm filling up on liquids, I'm not going to have room for those good nutrients. Um, so I want to make sure that they're getting their solid food in and then they can do liquids between meals. Um, this is also going to help with some other complications that can come up that I'm going to talk about in a second. So complications and here my second TED talk's coming. Um, so dumping syndrome, I'm going to talk about this more in depth than another PowerPoint when I talk about gastric surgeries in general. Um, but dumping syndrome as a result, it's worse when you eat sugary foods, which is why, you know, we avoid the sugar free, especially immediately post-op. Um, it's not that I can't have any sugar, but like the high carbohydrate meals are going to make it worse, but effectively you have less um, less bowels in order to digest. So what happens is literally a dumping. It's like the stomach, the little tiny stomach dumps a lot of nutrients into the intestines. They get overwhelmed. They don't know what to do. They're like, oh my God, usually there's more intestine here to help, but it gets really overwhelmed. So fluid shifts happen and they can end up um, having um, dehydrate, like severe dehydration and getting really dizzy. And then they can also have later on um, end up having hypoglycemia because their body sends a bunch of insulin because all this food just got dumped and it overreacts and sends too much insulin and they can end up hypoglycemic. So we'll talk more about that, but kind of keep that in your mind. That's a pretty common um, thing can have, and they can even have it a little bit um, long-term, um, you know, with this. It luckily, hopefully, knock on wood goes away, but um, they can have problems with that. Um, anemia, um, specifically pernicious anemia. So um, we'll talk more about this too when we talk about upper GI stuff, but uh, there's something that's called, um, uh, what do you call it, um, intrinsic cells, and it's in the stomach. Uh, sorry, intran uh, parietal cells um, in the stomach, and they release something called intrinsic factor. So when I take in B12, um, parietal cells in my stomach release intrinsic factor, they attach to B12, and then it goes in my intestines and they're absorbed. Well, if I have less stomach and if I have no or like not the absorption part of my um, small intestine or less of that, um, I'm not going to be able to absorb vitamin B12 because I don't have the factors and things that I, that are necessary in order to get it. In other words, vitamin B12 by itself cannot get into the bloodstream. It needs those, uh, that intrinsic factor, those parietal cells working and, um, needs a place to be absorbed as well. Um, so we're going to be watching these patients for, um, vitamin B12 deficiencies, which again, we'll talk about later, but, um, you definitely, they may need vitamin B12 shots for life. Um, vitamin deficiencies in general. So here's the beginning of my TED talk. So a lot of times, again, it seems like this is a great fix. And even for someone who takes really good care of themselves after gastric bypass, um, it's great. And it, for many patients, this is so necessary. They need this. There's nothing else like the, the weight loss, the general nutrition changes, all that stuff I brought up. It's not going to be enough for them. They need more help. Um, but keep in mind, based on most of these surgeries, this patient's going to be chronically malnourished. I'm especially talking about the Ruan Y, like just based on the size of your stomach and how much intestines you have to absorb, no matter how well, you know, how much bang for your buck you get with those nutrients, this patient is going to be chronically um, to some degree malnourished or be lacking vitamins. They're going to need um, extra help in this area. Um, so just keep that in mind that, you know, again, it's not just an easy, simple thing with no complications on the other side. So um, they can be chronic, uh, have chronic issues when it comes to this uh, lack of vitamins. Um, also diarrhea, because they have less uh, time for processing. So again, that kind of goes with the dumping syndrome, um, but also in general, they're not absorbing as much. So it's going to come out more loosely so they can have chronic diarrhea and then psychological complications. So a significant change in their appearance, excess skin. You know, I had a family member who got this and um, was like, man, I feel so good about myself. I've lost so much weight, but then they had all this excess skin and they ended up having to get like so many procedures after um, the gastric bypass, just as a result of like how they felt about their physical appearance, um, despite the fact that they lost weight, you know, the skin is still there, especially because it's rapid weight loss. Um, so as a whole, again, and I'm, I'm not here to try to change your opinion, like, you know, this is not medical advice, um, but you should know as a nurse, um, you know, that it's not just a simple surgery, like, hey, they should just get gastric bypass. Great. Like, you know, like there is a lot of stuff that can come after. So it's really good to educate yourself and make sure that the patient's aware of, you know, what is their life going to have to be like? Because I've seen so many patients come in after gastric bypass, still ordering the fast food, still having problems with it. And that's why that um, psychological evaluation is so key, because keep in mind, 
it's like, you know, and again, you know, there's maybe people that don't believe this to be true, that it's not like alcoholism, but, you know, someone who's a chronic compulsive eater um, literally is without power. They are going to still keep shoving that food in their mouth and they are without power to stop doing that. And so if they don't get the right help that they need necessary in order to, you know, recover from their eating disorder, they're not going to be able to, you know, benefit from the surgery. They're still going to go back. Cause like for most of us, like it's going to be enough. You tell me, Hey, you can literally, um, your stomach can explode. Like it, you, you could die from this. That's enough for most people to not do something. But for someone who has, um, the chronic illness of, um, you know, whether, you know, like with alcoholism, with the alcohol, like there is nothing that's powerful or strong enough to really truly convince them not to do it. And it's not because of a lack of willpower. They are literally without power for that. Um, so that might be something that's hard for you to understand if you've never been in a situation where you're powerless over something. Um, but um, you need to understand, regardless of what your opinion is, is that you have to um, you know, be educated on what can happen on the other side of things. And what are the things you need to look out for for these patients um, that could come up with, um, regardless of the fact that they had this surgery, um, how are they managing their food? Like, how are you going to know that they're doing well with this procedure or might need some additional help? Last but not least, let's talk about metabolic syndrome. And now I think I promised the TED Talks are done. Um, I don't get on TED Talks too often with some things, but, um, you know, it's definitely, I think that there's, you know, I know right now, if you're watching this, you're probably like, lady, this is not going to be on my nursing school exam. Um, but, you know, I always tell students, I really want to help you to not only learn just how to think about how to approach patients, but, you know, to transition into care and be given what else you need. Because, yeah, you can pass all the exams, but if you don't know how to talk to patients, um, if you don't know about the reality of some of these procedures and other things, um, you know, there's going to be a big hill for you to climb. So, you know, as hard as it is in nursing school to sit there and to, hold on a sec, I'm getting thirsty. When I TED talk, you know, it drives me out um, as hard as it is sometimes to really sit there and focus on, well, OK, like, let me think long term about this or what's the bigger picture here. Um, you know, this is the place to start. Like, you know, um, I, I mean, I there's some nurses that are incredibly smart that I wouldn't want to touch me with a 10 foot pole because they don't have that bedside manner. So, um, you know, I'm hoping, you know, and my goal always as an educator is not just to get people through nursing school is to grow, you know, human beings that I would want to take care of me or my family. And so, um TED talk done. <laughs> so anyway, so let's talk about metabolic syndrome. Um, so metabolic syndrome is really just a group of risk factors. So it's not even really a disease. It's a group of risk factors that pretty much tells you, huh, like if the patient has these risk factors, they are high risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, and diabetes. So the four risk factors are going to be obesity. And we measure obesity through their waist circumference. So, um, you know, if you had a test question on this, it would be giving you waist circumference. That's why you want to know the waist for circumference for sure. You know, it's, uh, I'm not going to remember it now. What is it? Greater than 35 for women greater than 40 for men, maybe I might be lying, look back through or, you know, scroll back through my PowerPoint. Um, and um, hypertension, uh, you know, high blood pressure, we're going to look at what their blood pressure values are, um, elevated cholesterol or hyperlipidemia, and elevated glucose levels. So that's not necessarily diabetes, but um, having all of these, um, you know, increased waist circumference, increased blood pressure, increased lipids, increased glucose, altogether, it leads to a quadrifecta of um, risk for cardiovascular disease. So what do we do for these patients? Uh, lifestyle modifications, diet and weight loss is going to be key for these patients. Um, we want to do drug therapy to reduce their risks. Um, and so like, think about, we want to hit all of the risk factors. Um, so we want them to hopefully help to encourage them to lose weight. And again, following all those healthy things to lose weight, a long-term change. Um, we want to decrease their cholesterol so we can use medications like statins and things like that to help to decrease cholesterol, um, diet changes, low fat diet, um, decrease blood pressure, also decreasing sodium, things like that can help. So antihypertensives and also that heart healthy diet, um, controlling blood glucose. So insulin, other anti-diabetics, um, and um, monitoring that hemoglobin A1C pretty regularly. And then of course, you know, stop smoking because it's so hard on the blood vessels and regular physical exercise can go a long way. All right, you survived me for another video. On to the next one.